So my name is, for those that don't know me, my name is John Newman. I'm the, I guess I'm a team leader squared, which sounds funny because I'm team leader of the Croft and Fort Meade Market Center, but I also have a, a team as well. It used to be called the Newman Group. It will now be called Think um, in about 30 days. So uh, we actually have our team operates in multiple different locations. So we have a team in Millersville, one in Canton, uh, and we're in conversations with one in Philadelphia and one in South Florida. So I've been in real estate since 2007. Leslie, like your eyes just like went crazy for a second. Do you have a question? All right. Leslie was like, what in the world was he talking about? Um, so uh, I've been in real estate since 2007, actually since 2003. I got my license in 2007. So from 2003 until 2007, I was unlicensed, but I flipped houses for four years. That's all I did. So um, we flipped about 75 to 80 properties from 03 to 07. Anybody remember what happened in 07? Not a good time to have 25 properties under renovation. So um, I went from having a high net worth to having no net worth in about 17 months. So I jokingly tell people I actually failed my way into residential real estate. I, I, I had no intentions of becoming a realtor. Um, truth of the matter is 2007, February, 2007 hit, I couldn't flip properties anymore because I was going losing money faster than I was making it. And I had no other options. So I enjoyed real estate. I read this book called The Millionaire Real Estate Agent. I said, all right, cool. Let's give that a try. Um, so that was February of 2007. St started a team in 2009. Um, then joined a team in late 2012. So I went from a single agent, started a team, then joined another team, was with that team for two years, and then started with uh, the Newman Group in October of 2012. And last year, um, we went from basically like zero to, well, actually this year we'll do about 240 transactions, which doesn't make us, um, compared to a lot of people today, really doesn't, that's not a big deal. I mean, that's, I mean, there are teams out there now doing 2,000, 20,000 transactions. So it just shows the evolution of our industry. I have been, um, I haven't worked with a buyer since 2000. 13, probably. I've always been listing focused. So matter of fact, the whole entire last year, the team, we were 70% listings and only 30% buyers. So we've always been a very, very listing um, focused team. And I've always been a very, very listing focused individual. So here we are, we're teaching a, a course on finding and converting seller leads. Don't do that. Like I'm gonna share with you a lot of things of what not to do, as long as some things of what I have found through my experience work, but I'm gonna tell you a lot of things that don't work with an, in an effort that you don't make the same mistakes that I made. Because had I just followed the models, which is, you all have probably heard that a lot, um, I probably would have had, I've had fewer gray hairs than I have right now, but more importantly, we'd already be in a position where we're selling 2,000, 3,000 houses. The biggest mistakes that I made early in my career was thinking that I was intelligent. And um, in six personal perspectives, they call it going from E to P. I was all E, wanted to do everything entrepreneurially and did not follow models and systems of those that have walked before me. So read the book and um, apply what they say in the book. So... Many of us, especially it seems like most of us are newer, you're gonna be bombarded with all of these companies that will call you and tell you that they have all of these quote unquote leads. And most of us, especially as newer agents, we need leads. So um, tidbit number one, you all have all the leads that you ever need. 
when I got started in the business, we didn't have a CRM system. So this wasn't that long ago. Um, didn't even have websites. Matter of fact, you couldn't look at houses online in 2007. I paid $3,500 to have my first website built because websites were new for real estate agents. Um, and I built a website because I wanted more leads. And things have evolved since then. We didn't have social media. We didn't have Facebook. We didn't have, um, heck, we had to pay for every text message that we sent out. So text messaging was kind of like brand new back then. And I am showing my age. Um, right now, you have, I would make the argument that the business is 20 times easier today than it was in 2007 because we have technology. The good news of technology is it can make our life easier, supposedly. The bad news with technology is we can use technology as an excuse as to why we're not reaching our goals. Hold you accountable on follow-ups, I'd say. Yeah, so if we have all this great technology now, then how would I use that as an excuse? Becoming lazy. Yeah, uh, command doesn't do what I needed to do. Facebook took away the ability to allow me to sort my friend list. Um, my website is a little clunky. I didn't get the one person that responded right. Uh, this house, for some reason I just listed, isn't showing up on Zillow and my client is upset with me. Like there's all kinds of reasons that we can make where the reason that we're not successful is because of the technology that we actually have. And the truth of the matter is when I got started, so prior to getting into real estate investing, I was a stockbroker, and I wish I had one here. Um, my, so I had to go through um, all of these licenses, just like you all have to do for a real estate license. So I had to get a Series 7, 63, 65 license. And so I'm excited. I got my license. I'm like, I can, I'm, like, I'm a stockbroker now. What do I do? And my sales manager says, here's a script. And here's a list of people to call. And here's a, a white notepad. I want you to call all these people, say this script. And when you're done, come back to me and ask any questions. So did I have any technology? Had a pen, paper, notepad, and a phone. And I think that was one of the greatest assets for me getting into real estate because I understood that lead generation was the name of the game. So when I got into real estate, it was, I don't wanna say it was simple for me, but it was like, okay, great. Give me a list of people to call. Tell me what to say and I'll do it. And simple sometimes can be very, very effective. Now we give people all these tools. Well, you can do business on Facebook and you can do it Instagram. And they got this new thing called TikTok out uh, now. And we have this beautiful thing called command. And you can do all these different things. And I think sometimes we actually get confused or we get paralysis by analysis. Well, which one works best? Well, which one works best? Well, how about that one? I met with an agent last week. God bless her soul. Let's just say that she's a little older than me and I'm 50. And she was like, I have, hey, John, I need to master TikTok. And now this agent's been in business for 33 years and has those roughly about 80 transactions a year. And I'm like, you need to master what? I need to master TikTok. I'm like, why? Well, because everybody's doing TikTok now. And I said, well, show me your database because you've been selling houses for 30 years. So do you have the name, address, phone number, email address, social media profile of every single person you've sold a house to? Well, no, I don't. Well, then why are we worried about TikTok? Like if I, if I wanted to be honest with her, like you're not a TikTok star. That's not who you are. I know you, you're not a TikToker. You're, you're a very, very, very good and talented real estate agent. So go talk to the people that you've already done business with. So as we dive into this, I'd like your permission that I will be blunt sometimes. Um, I will go off topic because I have ADHD. So I go wherever my mind takes me or wherever the audience is going to take me. But I'm going to remove a lot of your limiting beliefs. So at the end of this, you're going to realize that most agents think that their number one challenge is leads. Is there anybody here on the screen that believes that they had more leads, they'd be more successful or they do more business? And Leslie's like, no, I have all the leads that I need. Why do you say that, Leslie? Um, I have a lot of um, friends 
So if I actually work the people that I know, I probably have a lot more business. That's just the honest truth. <laughs> you are exactly right, Leslie. I, I hate to minimize this, and this is being recorded, so I might get in trouble. But to reduce it to the ridiculousness, real estate's a popularity contest. Um, he or she or they that have the most friends and have the most conversations with the friends will do the most business. It's period, end of story. If anybody, and Amber, I'll get to you in one minute, honey. Um, if anybody wants to challenge this, please raise your hand right now because I will give you a very, very simple analogy to prove that I am correct. Anybody wanna challenge it just for fun? Come on, I've been saving this one all day long. Let me use it. Come on, guys. All right, I'm going to use it anyway. So if Khloe Kardashian, because my wife's into all these Kardashian people, I don't believe that she has a real estate license. Somebody correct me if I'm wrong. But if Khloe, if Khloe Kardashian decided tomorrow that she was going to get her real estate license and put out a tweet or a post or a TikTok or a whatever, how many of you believe that she would all of a sudden be inundated with people that want to hire her to sell real estate? Why in the world would people do that? Because clearly she probably doesn't know what she's doing. She just got a real estate license. So why would people hire her? People like her. Ah. Like Kardashian. Yeah, so, so we're in, a, we're in a, a world where influence matters. Yeah. And influence is over people. And if I know you, like you, trust you, perceive that you have um, your name is synonymous with honesty or value or hard work or effort or any of these things, they're going to hire you. So he, she, they, them that have the most friends in the biggest network will probably do the most business as long as they communicate with them effectively. So when you all hear the word or the two words lead generation, what I'd like you to do right now is remove the word lead generation because for some people that elicits negative emotion and just put conversations with people. And if you could just have systematic and frequent conversations with people, you're doing a good job of lead generating. You just don't call it lead generation anymore. You call it talking to people. And the beauty of today versus 20 years ago is there's multiple ways that you can effectively communicate with people. I can do it via email. I can do it via text message. I can do it via a, a direct message. I can do it via a Facebook post. I can do it via Instagram post. There's so many different ways that I can communicate with people now that didn't exist in 2007. In 2007, it'd be very, very unusual for me to call somebody at 12 o'clock at night. But it's not uncommon for me to send somebody a DM at 12 o'clock at night or for me to comment on their post or to engage with them in some way, shape, or form. All right, Ashley, you have a question? No, sorry, I was just raising my hand as like a yes to thinking she'd be inundated with leads. <laughs> oh, all right, perfect. Thanks, so. though. Thank you, Ashley. All right. Um, John, can I say something right quick? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so for me, I I talk to people all the time. I call myself a friendly Frida. I don't have <laughs> an issue with lead generation. For me, it's the technology, what to do with them after, you know, you get the leads, then what? So for me as a new agent, that's what I struggle with. All right. So I, I wrote that down, Amber, and I want to get to that. I, make, I will make sure that I will cover that. As we go through these slides, um, anybody else have any questions? Because the beauty of slides is it gives us a framework, but the challenge to slides is it gives us a framework. So with your permission, I'd rather answer specific questions than just go through this like I'm a teacher in a high school and say, okay, well, I need to cover the material so I can check off a box. So when I've taught this class multiple times, usually what I hear is how do I find leads, number one? How do I stay in, in relationship with leads, number two? How do I close them for an appointment, number three? That's usually what I hear 
um, broad based when I teach this specific course. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that else that you all would like to make sure that I cover? You can drop it in the chat or you can just turn your mic off and speak freely. All right, perfect. So if I can teach you how to find leads, how to systematically communicate with them, and then how to close them for an appointment, would that be a good use of your time? Absolutely. Awesome. Yes. Okay, perfect. So um, real estate agents day, like there's not many things that we have to do every single day. Actually, th let me rephrase it. There's a bazillion things that we think we have to do every single day, but there's really only five critical activities. So I'm gonna summarize all of these different things. Lead generate, which is connecting with new people. Lead follow up, which is connecting with people that are already existing. Script practice and role play, or let's just change that because some people don't like the word scripts. Practice your craft. Like, Take free throw shots before you get into the game. Because what's gonna happen is when, when we are coaching our team, like the first 30 days, we make them cold call people, a lot of people. And I know that sounds really, really harsh. And the reason we make them do that is we, we want you to get into the art of conversation as fast as possible. We want you to be able to handle objections as fast as possible. Because if you're at an open house, you're at a networking event and someone happens to say something. So, hey, John, you're in real estate. What do you think of the market? And you're sitting there saying, uh, um, uh, um, uh, it's good or it's bad. That's not going to elicit an emotion from that prospect to want to engage in business with you. So that's why we, pra we script practice and role play objections and um, I'm thinking about selling my house. What do you say to that? What's the response? Like, what's the response? I'm thinking about selling or I'm thinking about buying or is now a good time to sell? Is now a good time to buy? Uh, where do you think my house should be priced? Like, what is the process that we go through? So that's why we engage in script practice and role play. So lead generate, which is conversations with new people, lead follow-up conversations with people that are existing, script practice and role play, go on appointments and negotiate offers and contracts. That's it, that's your day. And as my wife so eloquently told me when I first got into the business, you see me working very, very hard, but you ain't making any money. So clearly you're doing the wrong things. And what I realized was I was spending a lot of time doing a lot of things that didn't make a big difference. I.e., what should this flyer look like? Because if this flyer is uber pretty, then that will somehow get me more business. So I spent a lot of time doing things that did not make me money. And it was evidenced by my, my own wife telling me that you're in the wrong job because you're spending a lot of time, but you're not making any money. So I had to focus on the priorities. Lead generate, lead follow-up, script practice and role play, go on appointments, negotiate offers and contracts. If you haven't done those things every single day, you have not worked. I know that's harsh. Once we've done those things, then we move to the right side. Once we've mastered those things, the grow your business and then you run your business. Well, first you have to grow the business in order to run the business. We don't do it first. We don't run the business first. Like I'm gonna tweak my website and I'm gonna build out da 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 That's called busy work. And one of the benefits and um, the detriments to getting into this business and being self-employed is we have a lot of free time. And that gives us free time to do things that are not dollar productive, as well as free time to do things that are very dollar productive. So how many appointments do we need to go on? Or how many people do we need to talk to every day? I usually aim for 10. Okay, 10, 10 conversations? contacts per day. Mm -hmm. All right, perfect. And how'd you come up with that number? It just felt right. Or I might've heard someone smart tell me, oh, I'm not yes. sure. <laughs> so I have it in my notes, 10 people a day. <laughs> all right, perfect. So 
So my question to each of you would be, okay, are you achieving the results that you want to achieve from those 10 conversations a day? And if the answer is yes, then keep doing it. If the answer is no, what do we do? We increase the conversations <laughs> because what else do we have to do? See, it's, it's the most important thing. Like you should be having enough conversations to get you to the number of appointments that you need. One of the challenges that we found, and then you should track your numbers, which a lot of us in real estate do not like to track our numbers. It seems like additional effort or additional work or it's duplicitous. But the truth of the matter is everybody in real estate wants a predictable business. It's, it's the number one challenge for people in real estate. It's like they have these highs and lows of business. Well, the way that you make it predictable is by tracking, tracking your numbers. So in other words, no matter what my lead generation strategy is, let's say I want to do open houses, you track the numbers. So how many open houses do you need to go to or do you need to conduct to achieve the, the goals that you want to achieve this year? And the only way you're going to know the answer to that is by tracking your numbers. So everything in real estate and everything in business can be boiled down to a very, very simple math equation. And your job is to figure out what that equation is. So how many conversations lead to how many appointments, which lead to how many contracts, which lead to how many closings. And you need to know that when you know those numbers, then you now have a predictable business. So more importantly, how many transactions do you need to achieve the, let's say you wanna make the number I hear more times than not is $100,000 a year. I don't know where that number comes from. They must teach it in real estate school. like. Somehow or number, that's always the number that I, how much money do you want to make? $100,000. I don't even know where it comes from. So $100,000 in today's market is roughly what, about 15 to 20 closings, somewhere in that neighborhood. And I'm, I'm not talking rentals. I'm talking like sales. It's probably, an, depending on your price range, like maybe you're, you have like a million dollar price range. We don't have that here. Our average price point is about $370,000. So our average gross commission is roughly about 7,500 bucks to $8,000. So I'm going to need somewhere 12 to 18 transactions to make gross $100,000 a year. So then how many appointments do I need to go into that? So appointments, not appointment like with my friend to have coffee. That's not an appointment. That's a conversation, but not an appointment. An appointment is I'm meeting with a seller that I've pre-qualified that is meeting with me with the intention of selling their house. Or it could be a buyer that's pre-qualified with the intention of buying a house, but that's what I would consider an appointment. And for most agents, especially those that are in the business like two years or less, you could use a safe number and say 50% of those appointments should convert into contracts. So if you need 12 closings, you're going to need 24 appointments. If you work 52 weeks a year, that's roughly one appoint, two appointments a month. You see how simple that sounds? You need to go on two appointments a month. You've got, you've got 160 hours to find two people that want to buy or sell a house and then meet with them. So what now holds us back from achieving that? I would say your process of how, you, how you're going to get those two appointments. All right, keep going. Anybody else? I just said us, you just have to keep forging forth and like you say, do your scripts, contact people. For me, it's, um, I've, I've explained before that before people sought me out, I was also a nurse. And so people just came to me and I did a lot of business and didn't really go after it. So now I'm in a new category because I'm retired. And uh, so I, I want to contact those people, but I don't want to be a nuisance to them. So I, I have to, but I'm, my mantra is trust the system. 
that's why I'm reading the book and I'm going to do what it says. I'm going to do what you say. Trust so, the process. Yes. I just have to go and call people whether I feel like I'm going to be a nuisance to them or not, but I need to know the script. And I'll, I'll give, I'll give you, Hey, Cynthia. So you want me to give you a script right now for what you can say to them? What? <laughs> Write this down. Okay. I'm ready. I'll give you two actually. One is, hey, what's up? And if that's not how you communicate, hey, this is Cynthia, how are you? It's been a while since we last spoke. Mm -hmm. that, there's your script. That's it, huh? That's it. And then they'll ask what I'm doing now and I tell them. Oh, so what are you up to, Cynthia? What are you gonna say? I got my real estate license back. So if you have any needs or anybody that you know that has a need, let me know. All right, perfect. How's a wife and kids? Family, occupation, recreation, dreams. So you can write down Ford, F-O-R-D, family, occupation, recreation, and dreams. Mm -hmm. Keep it about them. Like it, it, it feels salesy or it feels like, oh, I'm worried about becoming a nuisance when you make it about you. Okay. Like, what about just asking them how they're doing? Like, I haven't heard, you know, I'm sorry, I lost, I lost contact with you. It's been a while. How are you doing? Mm -hmm. Like, does that feel salesy? No. Well, it would if you don't mean it, but I mean, <laughs> <laughs> keep it about them. Okay. Just keep it about them. It's very, very simple. Now, Charles, you've been licensed for what, all of? 13 days or something like that? Just about. All right. So I asked the question, what do you think holds people back from two appointments per month? And you said, well, it could be systems. And you could probably rattle off about 15 different things. It could be systems. It could be leads. It could be, you don't know what to say. It could be, what would I do if I got the lead? It could be a lot of different things that you could come up with, right? Yeah. All right. So... Can I play a, a quick uh, role play with you? Uh, sure. All right, Charles. All right, cool. So you're 13 days in the business. Let's all agree that you don't know a whole lot about real estate right now. Is that fair enough? That's fair. Yeah. Okay, cool. All right. No problem. Um, would you like to make $100,000 a year? Sure. Absolutely. Okay. So on a scale of one to 10, what's your commitment level to make $100,000 a year, which Meaning like you're willing to do whatever it takes to make $100,000 a year. Have to be a 10. Is it a 10? If that's what I was looking to make, yes. At this okay. point, I'm just looking. Just... All right, cool. All right, <laughs> so do you have um, two transactions lined up right now, Charles? Two listings or no. buyers that are that are under a buyer agreement? I do not know. Okay. Um, it's... May 31st, so tomorrow is June 1st. So by June 30th, you need to have uh, two clients that you're working with. Technically speaking, yeah. Do you think you can do that? Um, yeah, I think as long as, I mean, I just today before I left the house, I had to go to the grocery store and um, I set up, cause I put my whole entire contact log into, cause I couldn't figure out the export thing, um, one by one into command. Uh -huh. So all I have is their phone numbers. I don't have their emails and all, but I sent out 20 smart plans and I um, actually somebody I used to work at the bank with, they came back and they're looking to sell their house that's paid off and buy another house as like a downsize. So I'm at the point of like at that, but I don't know <laughs> really what to do about the next steps and all. And I'm not even, I just got my picture taken yesterday. So <laughs> so what, what's your confidence level, Charles? And just be honest that in the next 30 days, you're going to have two pieces of business that are under, under contract. So that means a listing agreement signed or a buyer representation agreement signed. Uh, On a scale of one to 10, what's your confidence level? Four and a half, five. Four and a half or five. And why isn't it at a 10? Because I feel like there's a lot of things I got to get in place before I can start like branching off and kind of having those in-depth conversations and all. Okay, fair enough. Um, all right, Charles. Um, can I be very, very, and this is going to sound harsh, but can I be blunt with you? 
Sure. Do you have anything that's really important to you, Charles? Dog, family. pet, car, wife, kids, whatever. All of that. Okay. Oh, okay. If your life depended on it, are you going to lose that car that you love so much in the next 30 days if you didn't get two pieces of business? What would you do now? I would sell the car. And so I can... <laughs> All right. So let's say that the car is like your baby. You ain't getting rid of that car. But the only way you're keeping that car is to find two pieces of business. With me so far? I feel like I, yeah, I feel like I would have to drop other things I like to do in order to focus on getting to where I need to be to keep what I love or going from their own. So, so what would you do now? What, so what would you do uh, differently? I would try things that step me out of my comfort zone, probably like going out and door to door, going out to uh, community chamber events and get my feet wet a little bit, even though I don't have that knowledge, I'm just going to learn from talking to other people. Hopefully would be the plan. So, so why would you do that? Uh, because just communicating with other people, I could learn some things from them and just how to go about even objections and not understanding really what they're saying just holding it and say hey this is how they used it and kind of backtrack and make my own use out of that or go from there so are you stepping out of your comfort zone now because you just told me what you would do differently if i was going to take your car so why aren't you doing that now i guess because you're not taking my car i haven't really <laughs> oh <all> <laughs> yeah so the number one reason that I see that agents don't succeed, thank you very much, Charles. I'm not taking your car, buddy. Um, it's their want to. See, if you're faced with something where it's, you know, there's analogies like burn the bridges, I don't have a choice, there's no option. Like I've done this, this class and other classes so many times and with brand new agents, seasoned agents that aren't achieving their goals. And usually I'll make this, statement like if your life depended on it could you do it and then 99.9% .9 of the time well of course if my life depended on it, I could do it well then what's the difference the, the only difference is your want to so when it comes down to goal setting you have the resources human beings naturally have the resources that we need to survive like we were born biologically to survive to figure things out we have all the resources we need to get whatever we want in this world. I could YouTube just about anything right now and figure out how to do it if I wanted to bad enough. So the question that you ask yourself when it comes down, no matter what I teach you in, your, in this class of how to find sellers and scripts and blah, 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 blah. If it's not in here, if you don't want to bad enough, you're not going to do it. So you need to get your want to in order first because nothing else matters if you don't have a want to. Any questions on that? And Charles, I appreciate you for role playing that with me. So the first thing that I would ask myself is why is it important to me? What's my want to? And what happens if I don't do this? What's the downside? So when I got into the business, I had a wife and three kids and I was broke, broke, broke because I had 23 properties in the middle of a recession and the greatest financial collapse. I had no other options than to succeed in this business. I didn't have a way out. It was either go get a job somewhere and trust me, I tried. I applied at Nordstrom's and was denied. Like nobody was hiring in 2007. So I didn't have any other options to make this work. And if I didn't make it work, then I'm losing my house, I'm losing my car. I'd probably lose my wife and my kids. So my want to was pretty bad. So I had to do whatever by any means necessary, I had to figure it out. Did I wanna knock on doors? No, I didn't wanna knock on doors, but I needed to knock on doors because I did whatever it took to be successful in this business. I didn't wanna do open houses and spend my Sundays. I like watching football and I'm a big fantasy football fanatic. You think I wanted to do that? No, I did not. But my wife and my kids and my house are more important to me than watching fantasy football. So when you get your one, two in check, everything else will figure itself out. So that's lesson number one. All right, any questions on this? So what do we do every single day? Five things, lead generate, lead follow-up, script practice and role play, 
go on appointments, negotiate contracts and offers. Mm -hmm. And if you haven't done that, you haven't worked today because the last time I checked, we don't get paid a salary to be in real estate. All right, so what's a seller? Now we're going to define what is a lead? Could anybody else hear Leslie or was no, it me? It broke up. No, we can't hear her. Now? Oh, you came in for a second and then we lost you. Okay. Going in and out. All right, there you go. Now. Ah, nope. You can drop it in the chat, Leslie, and then I'll read it out to everybody if you'd like to. I was just going to say a lead is, I guess, someone that you know that may be interested in buying or selling real estate or investing. All right. I love that. So was that Amber? Yes, it was. So Amber said that a lead is someone that is interested or potentially interested in buying, selling, or investing in real estate. Now, Leslie says... Um, Okima says, anyone who displays an interest in buying or selling a house. And then Leslie said, a person whose contact info who may potentially become a contact or a client. So I'll give you my definition of what I've, I've experienced of what a lead is. And I think there's a difference between a lead and a prospect. Mm -hmm. So a lead, in my opinion, if I gave you a list of every um, homeowner in the state of Maryland that had equity and their phone numbers, are they a lead? Yes. Yeah, they're a lead. Are they a prospect? Maybe. So a lead would make the, and in, inside of, and we're going to see a chart on this. I just like my version better, to be honest with you. A lead would not become a prospect until I've had a two-way dialogue and they've expressed some interest. In real estate, I think we get confused sometimes and we think that a lead is someone because I've heard so many agents say, I want to know where the good leads are. And I'm like, I probably spent a half million dollars looking for them. And if I found where the good leads are, I probably wouldn't be telling you. I keep them all for myself because there's no such thing as a good lead. There's good systems to nurture leads. There's good systems to nurture prospects, but there's no source of good leads. We have all the leads that we need readily at our fingertips. You can go down to the courthouse um, in any county right now and I'll give you all source of leads that could become prospects. And it's public record when somebody um, passes away and opens a probate case. So a probate case is um, when someone passes away and their heirs are going to inherit a piece of property. In the state of Maryland, just to give you all a rough idea, these people need to sell these houses for the most part, not all of them, but the majority of them need to sell these houses. And in the state of Maryland in the last, just in the month of May, there's about 2000 probate cases that have been opened. So that's about 2000 potential homeowners that need to sell a house. The beauty of it, if you go to the courthouse, because it's all public information, not only do you know that unfortunately the person's passed away, but you also have their heirs, the next of kin, you have their information and you have their phone numbers. Is that a good source of leads? Mm -hmm. Yes, all right. absolutely. All right, um, so you, you now have all the leads that you need guys. So I just yep. give you one strategy. You don't have a lead problem anymore. Now, John, um, when you go to the courthouse, just to be clear, what, is, what are you specifically asking from the clerk? Are you asking for, um, you know, what, what document, I mean, what, yeah, what are you asking for? 
Yeah, so I'm gonna I'm gonna show you all another site right now. Um, now this is just one strategy that I'll give you. So can you all see my screen? A little bit. All right. So I just Googled Maryland wills and estates. Oh, okay. And you'll see this um, website right here that is Office of the Register of Wills. And then you can click on the agree to terms. And in here, I can put in Anne Arundel County, the state. And I want a regular estate. And I could put in a date range. So let's just say I want May 1st, because I'm in Anne Arundel County. So I'm just showing me Anne Arundel County. 72 records. These are all the estates that have been opened in the last 30 days in just Anne Arundel County. And then I can click on this file and I can take this estate number and I go to the Office of Wills and Probates at the circuit court and they have a little computer there. And I can sit on that computer and type in this estate number and it'll give me all of these records right here. And I'm telling you, it's a gold mine, guys. Like it will tell me like, if they own 10 different pieces of property, I'll have a list of every single address of all the property that they own. So to answer the question, you can do it that way, or you can just go to the register of wills and you can say, hey, I'd like to do an estate search. And there's a computer there and then they'll even walk you how to, how to use it. I wanna find all of the cases, I'm a real estate agent. I wanna find all the probate cases that have been opened in the last 30 days. So when, when you're trying to identify like any type of lead, when you say I'm looking for the, the good leads, what we're really saying is we're trying to find people that are motivated, have an interest to sell and have a timeline. Well, do you think these people are motivated? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. This is good stuff, John. Thank you. And that's just that that's just one one um one lead source that I can give you another lead source that's very, very easy. Um absentee owners. So people that own rental properties that have tenants in them. Now they may not want to sell now, but when that tenant stop making, stops making payments or there's a problem, do you think they have a motivation to sell? Mm -hmm. you, can, you have access to free tools right through Bright that you can find lists of all the absentee owners that you need. So I'm gonna show you right now what this would look like. And this is free, guys. Like, this is free. I hear people saying that they want to pay for leads. I'm like, are you crazy? You got free stuff. You just need to learn how to use it. So this is Bright MLS. Oh, I'm sorry. They took it out. When you sign up for Bright MLS, you get a subscription for something called Remine. It's R-E-M-I-N-E dot -E com. Then you'll just use your Bright login. And I'm not going to remember mine. Oh, no. Hopefully it auto fills. Oh, it did. It auto filled. This is free of charge, guys. I can go in here and I can click search. And on the left hand side, you see all of these parameters. So I can search for houses that have property values of 500,000 plus. They have $50,000 of home equity plus. And I can put in a bunch of different absentee owner occupants. And then I can hit search and it's going to pull up every house that is owned by an absentee owner that has $500,000 plus of market value and has $50,000 plus of equity. And it gives me all of the houses that meet that criteria. I can do that for any zip code in the entire state. So now what I can do is I can reverse, <coughs> hell, they'll even give you their phone number sometimes. Not all the time, but sometimes. 
So I click save the search. Here's my absentee owner list. Oh, I hit the wrong button. Go to my cart. I should do a whole class on this because it's free. And these are just lists. And here's what it'll pull up. It gives you so much information. So this is a list that one of my agents pulled. They're trying to target the Clarksburg, Maryland area. Tells me how much equity they have, how long they've owned the house, who the owners are, what their mortgage balance is, when they bought the house, who their mortgage is with. And then sometimes it'll give me the con. Oh, look, there's the contact information for the owners. Even got their email addresses. Now that I was wondering, how do you decipher which email to use? Um, we would just use them all. <laughs> John, so um, the definition of an absentee owner is just basically someone who just rents out the property that does not live there? Yep, exactly. Oh, okay, I just wanted to make sure. Exactly. Now, using Remind, I could pull, um, I want to pull a specific neighborhood of people that have lived in a house for 10 plus years, which means that there's a higher possibility that they're selling than someone that bought the house a year ago. Um, I could put 10 plus years. I could put that have, you know, $50,000 or more in equity. And I could print out that list as well. And then I could call them. I could door knock them. I could mail them. The question is, what am I willing to do? Like, what is my want to? Am, am I, am I, do I want too bad enough that I'm going to just go and knock on that door or I'm going to cold call them or I'm going to spend money and mail them? They're all there. The leads are all there. So when I think of a lead, I think of a, there's a lead, a lead is just a piece of data. And, and I, I think somebody, I think Leslie kind of talked about this. A, a lead is nothing more than a name and a number and a piece of data. A prospect is somebody that I've engaged in conversations with and I've gotten to express interest. So I need to track the number of leads that I have, but more importantly, the number of prospects that I have. And then most importantly, the number of appointments that I'm setting with my prospects. So at the end of a week, it's not just about, did I make my contacts? Because you could make 10, 15 contacts a day, but you could still lose. Like you could still lose the inning and you lose enough innings, you could lose the game. So what we want to um, hold people accountable to is, did you hit your appointment number? Because if you've made a hundred contacts, but didn't hit your appointment number, do you get to go home and have a party this weekend? No. Do I get to go and play fantasy football all weekend? No, because I didn't get my appointment. So we want to track the appointments. All right, so do not call us. So under federal law, sellers and telemarketers, including real estate agents are prohibited from calling consumers on the do not call us. So if you're going to call people and you see that DNC right there, that means that they don't want to be called. So you should understand and adhere to the do not call. It does not mean that you can't knock on their door. It doesn't mean that you cannot mail them. It just means that you cannot cold call them. All right. So before we get into like all these, you know, other places to find leads, the number one source. So you should have three different strategies or three different priorities when you're building your business plan. So number one is going to be your database. Your database is everyone that knows who you are. And when I think about this, I don't mean like your best friends, the people that you go out to dinners or drinks with. I literally mean, think of it this way. If you hit the lottery tomorrow and won $250 million on Powerball and they put a Facebook post out with your face on it and your name on it, and who's going to reach out to you? Like you're going to have like, your best friend from 
elementary school calling you saying, oh my gosh, I can't believe the, so your database should be every single person that you've ever had a relationship with. Most people I find can easily get to about 150 to 200 people on their database if they try hard enough. And that's number one. So you first want to start with your database. And if somebody says they don't know 150 to 200 people, give me your Facebook profile because the average person has about 600 people on Facebook that they're friends with. Anybody you write a check to, your dentist, the person to cut your hair, anybody that you give money to should be in your database because heck, you're paying them. Why shouldn't they give you an opportunity for you to get paid? High school, college, friends, friends of friends, um, the mom's group, the dad's group, the soccer team, the keep on going. All of these people should be in your database. And then you need to systematically communicate with them. So number one is gonna be you need to gather their information, gather their data. So an easy way to do it today when I have people that I don't have their information from is basically it's like um, comment, comment, DM, schedule phone conversation. So what I mean by that is like, I'll have people that I'm friends with on Facebook, but I don't have their relevant information on, but I'm either friends with them on Facebook or friends with them on Instagram. So I will comment, like comment on a post. So this is going to sound hard, like sound like I'm crazy or whatever, but like literally every night between 10 and 12 o'clock at night, I lay in bed and I stalk people. And what I mean by that is I'm looking for people that I need information on. So I know that I have a high school friend from high school that I was best buds with and I don't have his information, but he just posted that he bought a new dog. The truth of the matter is I don't care about his dog. I'm just being honest. Like the, the dog's really not that important to me, but it's important to him enough that he's gonna post about his dog. Wow, that's a cute dog. What kind of dog is that? I really don't care what kind of dog it is. I could Google it if I wanted to. But when I comment on his dog, they're gonna typically comment back. Oh, it's a schnauzer poo thing. Oh, really? I'm da 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 da. Now we strike up a conversation. I'm gonna comment again on something else. So next week, he makes a post about the Ravens won a football game. I'm not a Ravens fan, I'm a Cowboys fan. But nevertheless, wow, how was that Ravens game last night? You know, what do you think their season's gonna look like this year? I'm just trying to elicit a conversation. And then after I've had enough conversations on Facebook or Instagram, I'm not big on the TikTok thing yet, then I'm gonna send them, hey, I'm gonna send you a DM, would like to catch up. So now I'm gonna to slide to the DMs and send them a more personalized, hey, it's been a while since we got together. What are you up to now? Blah, 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 blah. What's a good number for me to reach out to you? So now I went from there in this virtual world. Now I have their phone number. Now I'm gonna call them up and say, hey, what's up? How are you? I noticed you bought the dog. Is that the first, like whatever. Like it's the beauty of social media is people put their lives out there for the most part. Some people don't, but for the most part, they're airing all of their life story out on social media. So what am I gonna to talk to them about? I'm gonna find something on social media that was important to them. And that's what I'm gonna to talk to them about. And I'm not even going to bring up real estate. They're going to bring that up for me. Because trust me, they're stalking me too. So it's going to be like, hey, Fred, been a while since we last spoke. How are things going? I saw you just bought the new dog, by the way. And I'm going down Ford, Family Occupation, Recreation, and Dreams. Are you married? You, where are you working now? And then what are they gonna ask? Somebody help me out here. If I ask you, Charles, what are you up to now? Are you still working at NSA? What are you gonna now say to me? What are you up to now? Oh yeah, I'm glad you asked. Uh, I've been in real estate for a little while. And I'm gonna leave it there. I'm not gonna go into like, hey, by the way, do you wanna buy a house with me? Or hey, by the way, do you wanna sell a house with me? 
I'm going to literally leave it right there because what they're expecting is that weird like salesperson pitch where it's going to be, and this is just me, where it's like, oh, you know, hey, by the way, who do you think that's thinking about buying or selling a house? I'm not going to go there yet because I just engaged in a conversation with you. I think it's a little too early to ask you for a sale. I'm going to try and deepen the relationship. Hey, would love to stay in touch. By the way, where are you living now? Oh, well, I'm living over in Odenton, let's just say. All right, great. Now, can I use that information that I have right there and probably find out where they live? Mm. If they own a house? Yes. How would I do that? You could, <clears throat> you could go on your public search. <laughs> yep, you got it. You got it. So if they own a house, it's probably going to show in tax records. Tax, yeah, tax records. And if they own a house, what kind of lead are they? I said lead, not prospect. Warm lead. <laughs> say they're a warm lead. A warm lead. Seller or refinance? Yeah, who was that? Amber. Amber, you're 100% correct. Every single person that you put into command, and I'm gonna give you, this is a very, very simple strategy, should be coded in one of two ways. If they own a house, they are a seller lead. We don't know when they're going to sell, but statistically speaking, that house is going to be sold. Either they're gonna sell it in their lifetime or their kids are gonna sell it when they pass away, God forbid. That house will transfer ownership 99.9% .9 of the time. If they, so if they own a house, I'm tagging them in command as a seller lead. And that's gonna tell me my follow-up system to stay in relationship with them. If they don't own a house, what kind of lead are they? Statistically speaking, about 70%. Buyer. They're a buyer lead. Perfect. So every person I have a conversation with, I'm trying to find out, do they own a house or do they not own a house? If they own a house, they're a seller lead, I need their address. If they don't own a house, they're a buyer lead. I just don't know when the transaction is going to happen, but I do know that the transaction will happen at some point in time. So now if you go through your database and you sort through everyone that you know or people that know of you or all these Facebook friends, most of you probably have an abundance of both seller and buyer leads. The question now becomes, what do we say to them and how do we continue that relationship? And I'll give you a script for that as well. Any questions so far? You all are making this way too easy. All right, we're gonna keep on our database. All right, so look, here's connecting questions. These are just details. I like Ford because I like analogies. So a little bit about your family, job, life. Ford's easy to remember. So family, occupation, recreation, and dreams. And then this just goes into, as you further the conversation, like you don't want to have it like the first conversation, you're just like, you know, uh, like a drill sergeant, like you're just asking 27 questions. That's going to be kind of weird. So this is what every conversation you're trying to grab another piece of information. So the first conversation might be, hey, where are you living now? I'm not gonna try and turn this into an hour long conversation. The second conversation, I'm trying to get another piece of data. And then as it goes down the pipeline, we will get more conversation. So then when you have And this will talk about a lead category. I call it a prospect category more so than a lead category. But that's just me. Because I think there's a difference between a lead and a prospect. So let's just take this off and say, instead of a lead category, call it a prospect category. Prospects can be sorted then, A's, B's, and C's. So a prospect A is somebody ready, willing, and able to do business now, immediately. A B prospect is going to be 15 to 60 days. A C prospect is 61 days or more. So we have them labeled one as a seller or buyer, then have them labeled as an A, B, or C. And that tells us the priority of our actions every single day.
So we're first going to do our lead generation because that's number one. Then we're going to do our lead follow-up. Who are we following up with first? We're going to follow up with our A's first, our B's second, and our C's third. So we're not going to do a real play. How many of you have all of your people, because you're kind of deep into this Ignite, have you all set up a database already and you have people to talk to in your database? I do. This is Amber. All right. So Amber, what challenges do you have right now then, if any? Um, like, I, like I said earlier, it's not so much as getting leads. Mine is, you know, trying to learn everything, knowing what to learn first, and then so follow setting up my systems and finding out how to get, you know, just all the information I need to assist my clients. That's okay. what I'm struggling with the most. Okay. All right. Well, then we're not going to role play, like categorizing the leads right now wouldn't be a good use of your time. I'd rather, I'd rather go to your question and where you need to be. So most of us, when we have prospects, once again, I don't want to call them leads, prospects, people that are ready to do business in the next like 90 to 120 days, most of us don't have any issues there. It's the people that are further out. Mm -hmm. and, and that's where we struggle. So here's the thing. Every seller, for most people, their most value, and I got this from my insurance agent, by the way. So just copy it and paste it because he's one of the few people that I know that I could recommend off the tip of my tongue. You asked me for an insurance agent, John Underwood, Nationwide Insurance. I got his number right here. Like I can't speak to many other professionals in that way. But so I just stole this idea from him. And we call it a 36 touch inside of KW. He has no idea what a 36 touch is, but he's been executing a 36 touch for about 20 years because that's about as long as I've been his insured, uh, a client of his. And here's what he does. He sends me a piece of email almost every single month. Now, I do not read this email in all honesty. I've, no, I've never read one of his emails, but I know that I get them. So that's 12 touches. He sends me a piece of mail. One of them is my bill, but it could be any other type of mail. Every single month, I get a piece of mail from John Underwood. So there's another 12 touches. So now we're up to 24. Mm -hmm. He calls me every single quarter and it's like clockwork. Matter of fact, it's almost the only time he calls me is the once a quarter. And here's one of the most powerful scripts that I can give you all this evening. And this will work for a seller lead. Hey, Mr. and Mrs. Jones, um, it's John Newman with Keller Williams. I know it's been a while since we last spoke, but I've just done a neighborhood analysis on your property at 123 Main Street. I'm going to send it over to you because I think it's important that you understand what's happening with your, the largest financial asset that you own. And I'm literally giving them what's called a, what you all would call a CMA, I guess. Hey, by the way, how's the wife and kids? How's the job? How's the, I go into family, occupation, recreation, and dreams. All right, great. I'll talk to you in 90 days. So what my insurance agent does, hey, John, I've just tweaked this for real estate. Hey, hey and he'll say, hey, Newman, it's Underwood. Just want to let you know, I've reviewed your policies. And unless something is coming up, I don't see any reasons to make any changes right now. By the way, how's Nicole and the kids? So what information did he get in that phone call? Did he give? He got that there was no changes with your policy. Bingo. Bingo. And, and if, I'm, if I'm thinking about making a change, what does he now know? Because like, hey, Newman, it's Underwood. I've reviewed your policies. Unless there's any changes upcoming, I don't see a reason to make any changes. He'll find out if you want to make any changes. Yeah. So if you're calling every homeowner and they own a house, hey, by the way, I've reviewed 
you can call it an equity analysis. You can call it a, uh, a homeowner analysis. You can call it a whatever. You can come up with your own name. Like I like the equity analysis because it sounds sexy. I've reviewed, I've done a quick equity analysis from you in reviewing your real estate portfolio because it makes them feel special. And unless there's any changes coming up, here's what's happening in the market. And you can tweak that however you want to tweak that. But if there's a change coming up, what do you want to tell me? What the change is? Yeah. Oh, hey, John. Yeah, thank you for this. By the way, we're considering selling. Or there might be some changes coming up because I might be taking a new job in New Jersey. Like it's going to elicit a conversation. And that's why you want to do it every 90 days. Because if you do it every 90 days, it gets you into a rhythm. It gets them into a rhythm. Because I know when Underwood calls me once a quarter, it's like, oh, there's Underwood. Like <laughs> it's time for our, our, our quarterly checkup, basically. So I can put it on my calendar. He can put it on his calendar. He knows, I know that he's going to be calling me because he's done it for 20 years now, once a quarter. And he's built brand recognition that he's the only person I think of when I think of insurance. And that's what you all are trying to do to your database. You're trying to build brand identity so that when someone is thinking about real estate, they're only thinking of you. The emails and the drip campaigns or the mail, that is done subconsciously. He's just planting a seed to keep me in the forefront of his mind. Even though I don't read the emails, I know I get them from John Underwood. So when you go through your database, the first thing that you should be doing is A, sorting them. Are they a seller lead? Are they a buyer lead? Remember, I'm using the word lead, not prospect. And then what is my 36 touch? So what are the touches that I can use knowing that one touch or four of the touches have to be a quarterly phone call? And my suggestion to you, if it's a seller lead, is to give them an equity analysis. Hey, Cynthia, I've reviewed your real estate portfolio. Here's what values are doing right now. Is there anything coming up that I need to be aware of? And you're gonna sound like a neighborhood market expert, which is, that's the people that people wanna hire when it comes to selling their house. Right. And if you do that consistently over time, you never, ever, ever have to be that weird salesperson because you're just coming from contribution and delivering value to them. Now it will take you some time, but once again, let's say you had 500 of these people Statistically speaking, about 7% of your database will turn over every single year. So if you had 300 people in your database and you did this to, that would be about 21 transactions. Mm -hmm. You know, John, everything you've said, I have a fi financial plan of my husband and I, because we're retired, but um, he calls us quarterly. He does the forward. Now I know everything that he's doing, <laughs> but we know he's going to call us quarterly and go over our financial analysis and what he recommends. And, and he always ends with, uh, do you have any friends or family that I might be able to help? Yeah. I can recognize everything that you're saying now. Yeah. It, it, it's simple. I mean, it's not, it's mm -hmm. not easy, but it's simple. Mm -hmm. And it's just you putting that system in place. So go into your command, sort the database, figure out what your 36 touch is going to be. But trust me, if you did nothing more than calling them once a quarter mm -hmm. and saying, hey, I have an equity analysis. By the way, how's the Ford family occupation, recreation and dreams? And then you can say, hey, by the way, who else do you know that I could do an equity analysis for? Right. If you just did that, most of our problems are solved. And when that is done consistently, then you go into, okay, what are the other lead strategies that I need? Because the other lead strategies that you need are only designed to add more people to that database. But if you don't have it done right to begin with, and I give you a thousand leads or a thousand prospects, what are you going to do with them? 
you don't have a system in place to nurture the ones that are there. So you probably won't nurture the ones that you give that anybody else gives you either. In command, is there actually, uh, is there technology that sets this up to let you know that it's quarterly or is this something you manually put in place? Um, so in command under the smart campaigns, you will find examples of other people's 36 touches. You will have to tweak it and make sure, like, don't do this because I had an agent on my team that did this. He used somebody else's 36 touch and forgot to put in his own name. So he was sending his clients another agent's name. So instead of saying, hi, this is Eric, it said, hi, this is Cynthia. Like you don't want to do that. So you can copy and paste somebody else's 36 touch. Just make sure you go in there and edit it. So that has your information or else you might be sending some, somebody else's phone number to your client base. Okay. The most important thing is the quarterly phone conversation. That's the most important thing because that's where you can elicit and get the engagement. And it can be a phone conversation, it could be a text conversation, but it's a two-way conversation. And it's the most important thing. And that just goes on your calendar. So when I had a phone call, like today, it's May 31st, I had a conversation with Cynthia. I'm going 90 days from now. I'm putting in my Google calendar that I need to call Cynthia with a quarterly update. Mm -hmm. And the idea is that every single person in your database will have, will be in your calendar with a quarterly update. Now, I know that this, this class is about seller leads. If it's a buyer, how would this work any differently? So let's say it's someone that does not own a house. Maybe finding out where they you know, want to move to and send them um, to um, send them the listings off of Bright MLS, start them on the something like that. You, you nailed it, Amber. Thank you. Nailed it. Yeah. If they don't own a house, hey, Cynthia, what are you up to? It's been a long time since we spoke. Family, occupation, recreation, and dreams. By the way, are you still renting over at 123 Main Street or in, in Millersville? Well, yes, I am. Well, just out of curiosity, if you ever were to move, where would you go? Mm -hmm. I'd, I'd move to wherever I'd move to. And, and what kind of house would you move to? What would your dream house look like? And then I'd set up a search for their dream house. And I literally would call it your dream house. That's good, your dream house, I like that. And then once a quarter, what am I calling them and saying, Amber? What you're gonna be saying is, Hey, anything changed or you still renting? Um, how's that going? And then you're going to explain probably the difference between renting and leaving a legacy for your family and yep. all this stuff. Yep. I'm going to give them relevant. I can't give them an equity analysis because they may not own a house yet, but I can give them relevant information. I can give them interest rate information on what interest rates are doing. I can give them information information on how values are doing in that neighborhood, what the supply and demand of houses for sale are. I can copy and paste an article from finance.yahoo.com on the benefits of home ownership versus renting. Like there's all kinds of relevant information that I can provide to somebody. And I just follow up with them and say, hey, I was thinking of you. And when I was thinking of you, this came up. By the way, how's the family? How the wife and kids, how's a new job, how's this job, et cetera, et cetera. Great, I'm gonna rinse, repeat, put them on my calendar, call them in 90 days and rinse and repeat the same process. I use social media to interact with them in between these 90 day periods. And that's where I'll go in and comment on the dog or the pet or the, I'll post random things on Facebook just to elicit engagement. Like, trust me, I see real estate agents all the time. They post real estate stuff on Facebook. Nobody cares about your real estate stuff on Facebook. Like, none of us like to see that somebody just listed a house. We really don't care, to be honest. For the most part, we really don't care. But what do we like to see on Facebook? Entertainment. 
entertainment. Like I post a picture, I could sell a $20 million house and I'll get like three comments. I post a picture of my kids, I'll get like 200 comments. <laughs> now I'm not saying to use your kids as advertising. That's not where I'm going, but I will post relevant things on Facebook only designed or Instagram to elicit engagement. So it could be like, hey, does anybody have a great recipe? I like to, to um, cook. So does anybody have a great recipe for a brisket? Do I really need somebody else's recipe for brisket? I could Google it if I wanted to. I only posted that to elicit engagement. Hey, anybody know a great place to get crabs in Baltimore? I could Google the best place to get crabs in Baltimore, but I do it to elicit engagement. So I typically will post on Facebook. If I'm in Facebook, I'll ask a question. Anybody know a good carpenter? Anybody know a good this? I'm only designed to, to try and get people to engage with the post, not deliver like real estate related stuff. So I have very, very little real estate. I have enough real estate stuff on my Facebook profile to let you know that I'm in real estate, but it's not spammy real estate agent guy. All right. So now let's say that we did, Cynthia, you, you called... Um, Mrs. Jones, who's in your database, you had the quarterly review and she now said, hey, by the way, we are thinking about selling the house. What do you do next? Um, I would ask if, and I know her, <laughs> this is a friend. Yeah, she's in your database. Oh, okay. okay. Well, if it's a friend, then I'm going to say, um, do you mind if I run some comps for you in your area to see what houses are selling for and we could get together and discuss it further. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, when's a good time for us to get together? Just very, very nonchalant. When's a good time for us to get together? Relaxed. Now, they will typically give you, well, how about next week or how about this week or blah, 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 blah. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get into the qualification phase. So have you all ever heard of, and this can be used for sellers or buyers. So write this down as another acronym, LP Mama. So, and this can be used once again for buyers or sellers. So I'll, I'll use it for a buyer first. L is location. So. If you could move, where would you think about going? P is price. What monthly mortgage payment are you looking to, um, what's your comfort zone as it pertains to a monthly payment? M is motivation. So why are you thinking about buying a new house? What's that gonna do for you and the family or for your lifestyle. The next M is mortgage. Have you been pre-qualified for a mortgage or will you be paying cash? The A is agent. Are you working with another agent? And then, and I misorganized these or I put them in the wrong order, but there's another A that is appointment. So location, price, motivation, agent. Location, price, motivation, agent, mortgage, appointment. LP, MA, MA. Now, if it's a seller, I already know their location because I have their address. But the price is, so if you were gonna sell your house, you, you have an idea of, of what you think the house is worth. What's the, why am I asking that question? Maybe you could see their price point of where they stand now and to what they can move to later. Well, if it's a seller, what I'm trying to figure out is, um, do they think their house is worth a million bucks? And I think it's worth 500,000. Mm. I'm trying to disqualify, I'm actually trying to disqualify the appointment. So I'm trying to get most people have an idea in their mind because we have access to computers now of what they think their house is worth. They may know that their neighbor, what their neighbor house sold for, 
So I'm just trying to get a rough idea of where their thought process is for pricing the property, just to see if we're even close to being in alignment. Um, motivation, why are you thinking about selling? The mortgage, I'm going to ask because I want to figure out what do they owe on the property? You know, are they underwater or not? So approximately, what do you owe in the house? Now, I, usually I've done some research ahead of time, so I can pull up on Remine or on, on um, other sites. Like, So it looks like you purchased the house in 2007 for $317,000 or something like that. Did you get a mortgage on that property? Approximately what's owed on that mortgage. And that will tell me whether or not, like I said, they have equity in the house. Are you working with another agent? Always good to ask. And if all those things check off boxes and I'm going for the appointment. Now, if they say, listen, yeah, I'm thinking about selling, but it's not going to be for another 12, 15 months. Am I going for a meeting right now? Probably not. But here's what I will tell you. No matter what somebody tells you, I had no intentions of selling my house. I bought a house in, 2000, in October of 2020. But if you'd have asked me in 2020, I would have told you I'm not selling my house for another 10 years. Because my plan was, I've got two kids, 18, 17. They're both going to go away to college. I'll be down to one kid. That last child is eight right now. I'm not going anywhere until she is out of the house. And then I'm downsizing. That was my plan. Mm -hmm. So if you're a real estate agent and you called me up and I was in your database, hey, John, what are you up to? Da, 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 I would have told you, yeah, I'm not going anywhere for at least another 10 years. Love my house, have no intentions on moving. That's why you want to call them every 90 days because life changes. Mm -hmm. So what happened with us in 2020 was this thing called COVID started going crazy. And my father-in-law, who is widowed, was all by himself. And we wanted him to be closer to us because he's 75 years old. So we made a decision that maybe it was time for us to buy another house. I had an in-law apartment so that I, our, my family could move in with us and we could all be together. But if you had just called me that one time and I said, okay, I'm not going away for 10 years. And you're like, okay, I'll touch base with you in 10 years. Like you would have lost out on that opportunity. So that's why every 90 days is important because you will typically hear about changes before it's too late. It's very improbable that I'm going to have a conversation with you today, Cynthia. And I ask you the question, is there anything coming up that I need to be aware of? And you say no. And then 30 days from now, you bought a new house. Like that's not typically how it works. It, it could happen, but it's typically not how it's going to work. So that's why every 90 days that follow-up is so important and having a system around that. Mm -hmm. Any questions so far? So that's what we just went through. The LP Mama is basically designed to just pre-qualify somebody because I don't want to go on appointments with people that are not motivated to sell their house or they're not ready to sell their house or they have improper expectations. Because I'll sell my house today for the right price, but I'm not motivated to sell. If somebody showed up with a big bag of cash, maybe I'd sell it but it'd be for an unreasonable number. So I'm not motivated. A pre-listing questionnaire. This is right in y'all's toolkit. And this is basically homework. The idea behind the homework is you will test somebody's motivation. So like we even do this for buyers now. We send them out homework and they have to describe like why they're moving, what their perfect house is. What we're able to do by giving them the homework is to really gauge how motivated they are. So utilize, and you can tweak the questionnaire that's in the toolkit, but have some sort of questionnaire and some sort of process. We're gonna skip the role play due to time. All right, this is the best part, the listing presentation. What do you think the number one criteria of a seller is that's selling their house? The price. Oh, how much they're going to net, of course. 
So if they're interviewing agents, what do you think that they're looking for? The most money and the least amount of commission. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they want to know. That, yes, they do want to know that, but they also want to know that you're knowledgeable about the, the area that they're selling a the house in. Mm -hmm. And if you're extremely knowledgeable, your presentation will not matter. And this is where I see people, um, mistakes that I made early on was spending more time on my presentation than spending time on understanding what the market is doing. So most people, you have about a 90% probability of getting the listing just by being the first person in the door. Matter of fact, I don't even bring a presentation. Well, I don't do many listings anymore, but I don't bring presentations with me anymore. I bring a, 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 a white notepad. And I'm just asking questions about them. But I also come prepared with an extreme knowledge of the marketplace. So if I'm selling a, a three bedroom, two bath rancher in Glen Burnie, I'm going to know everything about three bedroom, two bath ranchers in Glen Burnie. And that's where I want to spend a lot of my time preparing for the listing appointment. The, the presentation should be used as a backup, not as the crutch. So it's like the dessert, the cherry on top. The main course is your knowledge of the marketplace. So you should be spending or think about that you should be spending probably two to four hours preparing for a listing appointment before you go on the appointment. And you should be rehearsing with yourself or with another agent that you're friends with every objection that they're going to throw at you. And that's where the role play also comes in. So role play the listing presentation before you actually get in the presentation. And that's where the practice comes in. Like you need to be ready to go at game time and you don't practice during the game. Like you practice when there's practice and then during the game, you're playing. Mm -hmm. So if you know you have a listing appointment next Wednesday at three o'clock, then mark on your calendar and find somebody to role play with in the next five days before that appointment because typically you only get one shot at it. And that one shot could be eight, 10, 12, 15, $20,000. Like you do not want to wing it on an eight, 10, $12,000 transaction. We can't practice the listing presentation. That's a whole thing. All right, what questions do we have or ahas do we have right now? Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, good. Okay. I love how you said not to use the presentation as a crutch. Because I've never done a listing presentation, my thought process was, let me go and have this so I'll have something to guide me through. But what it sounds like you're saying is I should have rehearsed something similar to what I want to say and what I want to happen, but really go with an open mind of learning about the seller and having more um, knowledge in case you know they have questions or um, just to let them know what the market is doing so they understand that I am knowledgeable about real estate in their area and then gaining more information to guide the conversation as opposed to having the presentation guide the experience, which doesn't really feel personable, I don't think. Yeah, and, and that's why, um, thank you very much, Leslie. That's why I, I typically, and this is just what I did early on in my career and you can use this if you want to, but I always did what was called a two-step listing appointment. So, and the reason I did this, this way is because it allowed me to buy more time to practice. 
So here's how that would work. Let's just say that it doesn't make a difference where the prospect came from. I met somebody at the grocery store. We engaged in a conversation. They're thinking about selling their house. And once again, I did this out of necessity, not because I'm smart. I didn't know what to say early on in my career. So what I said is, listen, why don't I just pop by one day? I can take a look at the property and just, we can have a conversation. I'm not bringing any paperwork with me. There's, this is not like I'm coming there to sell your house. I'm just popping by to have a conversation with you. After that conversation, I'm gonna go back to my office, put together some research and a game plan, and then I can present to you my findings. What that allowed me to do was if you called me at three o'clock in the afternoon and said, you're thinking about selling your house, literally at five o'clock, I could, hey, I can pop by on my way home. I'm just popping by to have a conversation with you and to take a look at the property so that I can then do some research. The other benefit to doing it that way I found was that when I'm there in that conversation, I would tell them, I believe in doing a very thorough analysis on your property. And it wouldn't be fair without seeing your house to come right in and do a listing presentation. So I'm planting a seed that if any other agent does it that way, you may not want to hire them. <laughs> and what that- I love that, that's amazing. <laughs> what that allowed me to do, Leslie, is all I'm doing is popping by the property. I'm gonna take my white notepad. I'm taking a lot of notes, but I'm really just paying attention to them. I'm not coming with any predisposed. I'm just engaging in a conversation. And then what I'm gonna talk about is, so tell me about your house. Why are you thinking about selling? Like, like I'm just asking questions. And they feel non-threatened because I don't have any paperwork with me. They don't have to worry about like, oh, here comes the sales pitch. But when I leave, what do they want? Because I said, now what's going to happen next? I'm going to go back to my office and do a thorough analysis of your property. Okay. And I'll be able to come back to you and present to you my findings. What do they want to know now? When you're coming back with their analysis. Yeah. I want to know when you're coming back. <laughs> yeah. And, and when, I, when I come back. All that. Say again, Leslie? They want to know how much you think their house is worth so it's almost like you know you just give them a little tease you go and prepare and you come back and you give them all the you know all yep. the good stuff yep. <laughs> and and what that also allows me to do leslie is do more preparation spend more time like if i need help from an agent like let's i did this when i was a newer agent that allowed me to basically go find another agent and say hey here's what i'm thinking Am I missing something? Is so, like it allowed me to gather resources and rehearse so that I felt more prepared when I went back for that findings. Mm -hmm. We now do most of that on the phone. But mm -hmm. um, so the way that we do our, I teach our team to do a listing process is we have a conversation that leads to a discovery call. A discovery call is, I just want to discover what's going on. Then we do what's called a findings call. A findings call is based upon what we found in the discovery call, here's our findings. That's where we do the research. And then we go to an appointment. But as a, as a new agent, get as many appointments as you can because it'll get you in the habit of, of conducting appointments. Once you're, you feel very comfortable with that, you can switch to doing most of it over the phone. Um, we're now at a point where we get most of our agree listing agreements signed before we've ever seen the house. Wow. Because the only reason that we need to see the house is to determine a final price. So we can give you a range, establish a basis for working together. And then all I got to do is fill in the blank when, once I've seen the house, but we've already agreed basically to work together. But as a newer agent, go on as many appointments as you can because it'll get you in the habit of conducting appointments. 
and feel uncomfortable with, with the presentations or with the findings that you find. So John, for Charles, who said he had a possible prospect that wanted to downsize, I think he said, could he get the appointment and just tell them he wants to get the information and he'll come back with more and then contact his coach in the meantime to 100%. see? hundred percent. That's the, that's one of the powers I think of, of um, being with a company and I'm not making it, this isn't a Keller Williams sales pitch, but is the resources that we have around us and the fact that so many people are willing to share. Mm -hmm. Like my first, my very first listing appointment, I had two agents for my second one, actually. I had two agents from my market center go with me. Like they just volunteered to go help me out. So I went and did the whole like, hey, why don't I just pop by? And then I went and popped by and I was like, oh crap, what do I do next? Like, I didn't know what to do next. So I bought more time to figure out what to do next and other agents helped me. And then they said, hey, I'll go with you on this. Now, they were there for more moral support because I was prepared because I'd done my research now. I had figured out what my marketing plan was gonna be. I now put together my, I still have a copy of my first listing presentation. It bought me all of that time. And then I rehearsed it over and over and over again, role played it with other agents in the market center. Hey, I have a listing appointment tomorrow. I'd like to role play it with you. And people were more than happy to do that. But it, it was up to me. This is where it goes full circle back to the want to. I had to have enough want to and enough um, desire to be great that I would knowingly pull somebody aside and say, hey, can you help me out? Because I, I knew I was not, I hadn't done it before. So how can you be great at something you haven't done before? So I elicited other people in my market center on my ALC that had done this a lot and said, hey, can I rehearse this with you? And if you ask that question more times, not somebody will say, sure, I'd be happy to. Especially your ALC members. All right, what other questions do we have? Mm. So, all right, what's our first action item? What's the highest source of the leads that we have? Data. Your database. So your action step, I'm typing this in the chat. Action step number one is put people in, in our database. Action step number two is to sort them as either buyer or seller lead. Number three, get contact information if you don't have it. Action four, set them up on a 36 touch. Five, call them quarterly. And, and you can call the equity analysis, whatever you want to call it. But mm -hmm. So the action steps are inside of the chat right now. Mm -hmm. When you have done this, you should look at it and say, okay, remember there's about a seven. If you do this, if 
get about a 7% return by following this plan. So if you have 100 people in your database and you follow these steps, it'll equate to about seven transactions. If you want double that amount of transactions, you need to add another 100 people to your database. And how would we do that? Open houses, go to the courthouse, use Remind to pull an equity analysis, um, door knocking, cold calling, all of the above, all of these crazy lead generation sources are just designed to add, yes, thank you, Ashley, always ask for referrals. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. At the end of every conversation, hey, by the way, do you happen to know of anybody else that's thinking about buying, selling, or investing in real estate or looking for a career in real estate and start building passive wealth through profit share, passive income? Mm -hmm. You can do it in two steps. So step one, why don't I just pop by? I'm not bringing any paperwork with me. We're just going to have a conversation and I'm going to take a quick tour of the property. It's a very non-threatening to them. Leslie, you have any questions? All right. Um, while you're there at the property, you're just gonna ask them about them. Once again, you can use LP Mama as a framework, but literally just sit down at the, the kitchen table or their coffee table or on the couch. Um, I prefer a coffee table or a kitchen table than a couch, but whatever is more comfortable for them and just talk to them about them. Why are you thinking about selling? Tell me about your situation. And then just listen and write down the notes, take a tour of the house. So what I'm gonna do next, I'm gonna go back to the office and then you can, here's where you can tell them. You can say, it'll take you 48 hours. You can say, I wanna be really thorough. It's gonna take me 72 hours because there's a lot of homework that I wanna, like you can, you literally can, position this, whatever your schedule will allow you to position it. And that was the other reason I did it this way. So I wanted more control of my time. And then that period of time allows you to figure out what in the world do I do next? You just bought yourself time, time to do your research, time to role play and practice. Now, John, are we, is it okay? Because, you know, they drill into us with at your first face to face to get your um your disclosures done about agency relationships so do you do that on that first meeting mm -hmm. um that's no. what they teach us <laughs> that's what I, I'm I don't have to do any of that because we're not a client yet we're just two people okay. having a conversation okay like i i'm I want to remove the fear that consumers have. I'm, I'm dropping my cell phone number in the chat. If you all have any questions, feel free to text message me. I'm always available via text message. Okay. Um, and, and once again, this is just me. I've never been one of these people that wanted to be a quote unquote salesperson. I never wanted to be that person. Um, now I am a salesperson, but what I meant by that, I didn't want to be a pushy salesperson. That's just not my style. Right. So I wanted them to feel very comfortable and non-threatened. I hate it when I invite salespeople to my house. It's like this weird feeling of, oh my gosh, like the guy's coming over to give me an estimate. I know what that's going to lead to. He's going to try right. and sell me. So I wanted to disarm them. And when, when somebody feels disarmed, like they feel like they're not going to be sold, they tend to be more open with you because you can't sell me because you didn't bring any paperwork with you. So literally I bring a white notepad and I tell them on the phone conversation, Hey, listen, I'm just stopping by. I don't have any paperwork. We're just having a conversation. I'm just taking a tour of the property. And then they feel like, Oh, Thank God he's not going to be one of these salespeople that are going to come in and try and get me to sign something. Now, other people don't like that. There, here is the risk that you take by doing it in two steps. 
the risk that you may take sometimes is somebody has somebody else coming in right behind you. And that person is a, you know, we're going to sign paperwork today. So that's where I said, listen, and I learned that early on. So, um, and I'm glad you brought this up because I forgot this point. Um, I learned that very, very early on, like, oh man, like they'd signed paperwork before I got to the second appointment. And that's where I added, listen, I need to do a thorough research. You know, selling a house is, is, is not a, a small task. And I want to make sure that you can get the most amount of money in the shortest amount of time for getting this household. And I pride myself on doing a thorough analysis. Anybody else that can just walk into your house and tell you where you should sell your house for and get you to sign paperwork, I'd kind of question if that's the person I want to work with. So I planted a seed of doubt. Oh, you don't want to just sign paperwork for somebody that just walks in the door. Now I didn't bad mouth agents or anything. I'm not gonna like say that it's just, I'm just planting a seed of doubt. Mm -hmm. And what I found by doing that was then most people were willing to allow me to have that. I didn't lose anybody between that first appointment and that second appointment. But that is always the risk, just so you know. Mm -hmm. What I found was the risk the reward way outweighed the, the risk because I converted more appointments that I went on by doing it that way because I was more prepared. I love that strategy because I've been brand new, like 14 days into this. I was like, I don't think I'm going to be able to compete with Catherine down the street. I'm in North Beach. I don't know, but um, that approach giving me that, like, you know what? I am new, not going to let them know, but being able to like conversate with them coming into that and then kind of like understand who they are as a person and take all that information back and cram it into my own presentation. I feel like that would give me that um, peace of mind that, you know, I, I, I can do this as well. So I appreciate you sharing that. Yeah, it, it, it will give you a little more confidence because that first meeting, which interestingly enough, Charles, the first meeting is actually the most important meeting. Like that's where you're building the trust and rapport with people. Like I wanted to have as many first meetings as possible because I know statistically speaking, if I get in the door, I have a high probability of them working with me. And that's just facts. That's just stats from the National Association of Realtors. Like the majority of consumers hire the first person that they have a relationship and a face-to-face -face conversation with. So you, the game is to get as many of those at-bats as possible. You know, it, it's interesting. Um, I have a guy that, that works on the team, and he was a Broadway actor. Broadway performer, I guess is what it's called. Like he was in Hamilton and a bunch of these major things. And my daughter wanted to be um, or is thinking about becoming an actress, and that's still up for conversation right now. However, um, and I, I asked him about acting, and he said, acting's easy. He said, it, you just have to get it. It's all about auditions. It's not about being the best role for the part. It's just about going on as many auditions as possible to put yourself in a position to get lucky. And I was like, oh, so it's lead generation. Like acting is no more than lead generation. It's not going to be the smartest person or the best presentation that always gets you the business. Just like if you're an actor, it's not going to be that you're the best fit for the role. Like you could walk into and nail the audition, but your eyebrows look funky one day or something like that. And the casting director just says, for one reason or another, you're not a good fit. And you think that you nailed it. So it's about getting as many as bats as possible. And the same thing, how would this work for a buyer, guys? I'm, I'm thinking of, hey, Charles, we just met at the grocery store. Um, I'm in, and we somehow struck up a conversation over um, squash or whatever. And I come to find out that you're thinking about buying a house. Okay, you're 
come to think of, I'm fighting about buying a house. I no, I, I'm the I'm the prospective buyer. Yeah. Okay. You're <laughs> looking at squash. I'm looking at squash. For somehow we start talking about squash, and you struck up a conversation with me. I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm. Uh, it's the last meal we're cooking in our house because we're thinking about buying another house. So you know right away that I'm thinking about selling my house and buying another house. What would we do next? Uh, bad analogy, because let's just take it back to just a buyer. <laughs> All right, sorry, Charles. Um, we're at Home Depot. No, bad analogy. We're picking up our kids from the bait from the daycare. And I've got three of them and you've got two of them. And you're like, hey, John, it must be tough with those three little rascals. And I'm like, yeah, I need to get a house. This apartment that I'm renting is too small. I need to upgrade to a house. So you know now that I'm thinking about buying a house. What do you do next? I'd be like, wow, you have three kids in an apartment. Where, where do you stay at? Like, that's where I start at. And then I just kind of work from there. So how would you use a two-step process with this that way you don't have to worry about like do i know everything to answer do i know everything to say um kind of keeping it short and sweet there and just getting the information to contact you another time or like let you know that i i mean that i'm in the business as well and i could go from there with it or like we're... yeah hey, hey john um sounds like yeah it's got to be tough with uh three kids in that two-bedroom apartment um sounds like you might be thinking about buying a house hey you know, I don't mind if you don't mind. What's a good time for us to get together for a cup of coffee and we can just chat about the process? Yeah. Like it, it's it. All we're now going to do is just sit down and have a conversation. So, and then what are you going to ask? So, tell me about what you're looking to accomplish. What are you looking for? What are you trying to do? What I'm going to do next is I'm going to go back and put together an analysis to show you blah, 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 blah. And you can make up, like, do your buyer presentation or whatever you want to do. But I'm just trying to give myself permission that I don't have to know all of the answers at that moment in time. So I'm going to get together and have a cup of coffee with a notepad. And you just tell me about you and what you're trying to accomplish. And then I'll take this information, go back and do some research. And we can schedule a schedule a follow up conversation. That follow up conversation is the buyer appointment. But now I bought myself time to figure out. Okay, I just met with this guy. He he says he's thinking about buying a townhouse because he's got three kids. I don't know anything about what kind of mortgage he can qualify for, or this or that. Like, I bought myself time to go back and ask somebody else in the office. All right, what do I do now? I think I have somebody that wants to buy a house. What do I do now? And then they'll say, well, first you want to do this and this and this and this. Okay, great. I'll put together my presentation, follow up with a phone conversation, rehearse it with that person, and then nail it when I get together for that second meeting. And you kind of set the expectations of letting them know that hey, you are following up and they kind of already know that they have somebody helping them out along the yeah. route. So I like that. Yeah. It's very, very, it'll get you in the habit and get you very, very comfortable of just sitting down with people and talking to them about them, which is the, actually the most important thing. They don't care about you until they know that you care about them. True. So just talk to them about them. And Charles, never, ever, ever, um, for most of you that are here, um, there's no such thing in a consumer's eyes of a new or a seasoned real estate agent. That is a limiting belief that we have. Like, do you think I asked my mechanic, are you a new mechanic or are you an existing mechanic? I don't know anything about cars. All I know is that you have a mechanic's license. So therefore you must know what you're doing because I assume when you go to mechanic school, they tell you how to do everything. Now we know that they don't teach us all of this stuff in real estate school, right. but the consumers think that, oh, you have a real estate license. Therefore you must know what the heck you're doing. So remove the belief in your head that somehow or another, they care that whether you're new or you've been in business for 35 years, 
if it made a difference, then we all wouldn't be in the business because all of the agents that were in the business 35 years ago would have all of the business. People care and they want to do business with people they know, they like, and they trust. Doesn't make a difference how long you've been. And here's Charles. Um, did you go to college by any chance? I'm 22. I uh, left the bank. From four. I left the bank. Um, married? No. No. Not married. I have a girlfriend. We live in a house together. Okay. You have a girlfriend. So um, you have a best friend? I do. All right. So if your best friend was thinking about selling this house and you talk to him and I talk to him, who do you think your best friend would hire? Uh, most likely myself. Why? You don't know what the hell you're doing. Because our relationship, we've been together. Oh, so it doesn't make a difference whether or not you're brand new or you're not brand new because you've never sold a house, Charles, and I've sold a couple thousand of them. And you just told me that your best friend would hire you over me. He must be a fool. So make sense you put it that way. remove <laughs> your limiting beliefs. You are more than prepared, every one of you, to go out and crush this business. And that's why you start with your database, because these are people that either know you or know of you, mm -hmm. know who you are, and they are more than happy to transact business with you, as long as you have a system in place to stay in relationship with them and to nurture that relationship. So it's one of the things that I tell people, stop thinking of people like leads and prospects and start thinking of people like people. Just talk to people about people things. Mm -hmm. The business will take care of itself. Because we know, Charles, I can figure out in about 30 seconds what you do most likely. Do you have a Facebook profile? Yes. All right. So I can probably look you up and figure out exactly what you do. Now. Hopefully your Facebook profile says you're in real estate, not at the bank anymore. It does now, yes. <laughs> All right. Perfect. Um, so... I believe that if I'm going to do business with most people, I do a quick research on them. I don't know if you all do it, but I know that that's what I do. So if I want to look for a plumber or an electrician or a carpenter or something, I want to very, very quickly try and, and figure out who they are and what they're about. I mean, I, every single person we hire, I do that. Like I Facebook stalk every single, I asked them right on the initial interview, do you have a social media profile? What is it? Because I want to know, I want to know what you're about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think other people do that to us and we don't even know about it. Mm -hmm. I was say, it's funny you said that. That's uh, when George invited me to speak with him over at um, the Annapolis office. I looked him up before I went into it and just saw how great of a guy he was. And I was like, oh, I'm excited <laughs> to meet with him now. <laughs> and I went from there, so... Uh, Good point. Trust me, my, my son's girlfriend, my daughter's boyfriend, I darn sure knew who their parents were. I knew everything about them. I'm stalking them on Facebook. I need to know what they're about. So I just think that that's normal now. But I don't want to hear any of you all, if I meet you all at, a, at a, an event or someone, nobody says I'm a new agent. You, you are a licensed agent. You're not new, you're not old, you're a licensed agent. And that gives you the right and the credibility to do everything you need to do to reach your dreams. Any other questions? Mm -mm. Did you all find this helpful? Very. Absolutely. Yeah. Great. Yes. So how many appointments are you all going to set in the month of June? <laughs> Seven to ten. <laughs> Try. I want four per week. That's my goal. Oh, wow. All right. Yeah. <laughs> but, okay, but I want four per week. And what holds you all back from achieving whatever it is you want to achieve? Us. <laughs> yeah. Your yourself own, your yeah. own want to yeah so then you just ask yourself how bad do you want it true 
All right, you all have my cell phone number. If you have any questions, you want to run a scenario by me, any of the above, I'm happy to help. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much. <clears throat> not a problem. All right, I hope you all weren't too bored. No, not at all. Not at all. <laughs> all right, so step number one, what's step number one? Voter does. <laughs> Database. Database. <laughs> I cannot stress this enough. Please, 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 please don't be like me. Not doing this has probably cost me a half million dollars over the, the last whatever it is, 15 years. And trust me, if you don't do this now, wow. you're going to re repeat the same mistakes that I made and you're going to get a phone call from the best man of your wedding one day or the best woman at your wedding. I don't know what bridesmaid. True story. Best man of my wedding called me up one day and he was like, hey, John, I need your help. And I'm like, what's going on, Jack? Haven't heard from you a while because I didn't follow up with him. And he was literally in the middle of a real estate transaction that he wanted me to help him fix. Wow. And the same thing happened with my cousin, too. Same thing happened with my neighbor, too. I could keep going on. I could tell you, like, I could rattle off probably about 20, 30, 50, 500 people that did not transact real estate with me because I did not follow up with them. Okay. Don't do that. So put everybody in your data. Literally, it's your one thing, guys. Okay. Like, if you do nothing more in the whole month of, don't take a whole month to do it, but the next week and do nothing but put people in your database, it will probably be the best thing that you could do. Okay. And then put an action plan with each one of those people. And when you start putting them in there, you'll know what information you do not have. The most important pieces, of, and I'm sorry, I like to ramble. The most important pieces of information, name, phone number, email address, do they own or not? That's the most important piece of information. And then you can go every conversation, you're trying to grab another piece of information. When's her birthday? All right, if I know their birthday, what am I doing on their birthday? Sending them a birthday message. <laughs> so I'll give you a hint on that one. Pick up the phone and call them and wish them happy birthday because that will make you rare. Because what most people do, I get very, very few phone calls on my birthday, but I get hella people that comment on my Facebook page, like happy birthday, John. And I'm literally sitting there like, you haven't spoken to me in like 15 years, but you're going to take the time to wish me happy birthday. Like, but the 10 or 15 people that actually call me are memorable. Okay. And it's a lost art that actually somebody, God forbid, would actually call you on your birthday. You want to take it a step, another step further, send them a birthday card and then call them and wish them happy birthday. Like you're really special in my book. Now you sent me a card and called me. And if you're rare, you're valuable. So don't be like, and when it's your birthday and you get those raving fans, your 300 fans that all wish you happy birthday take the time and instead of just saying you know the one glamorous like i'd like to thank all my loyal followers for wishing me happy birthday why don't you pick up the phone and call them and say thank you or at least send them a direct message and say hey thank you very much for wishing me happy birthday it means a lot to me by the way how are you would love to catch up they won't trust me you do that people will be like dude what's wrong with this person like this guy's weird like he actually wants to talk to me. So another little tidbit. Okay. Good news. <laughs> all right. I will let you all run. I appreciate each one of you. If you have any Thank questions, you. feel free to reach out to me. Have a great evening. Be safe and be prosperous. Thank <laughs> you so much. Bye, everybody. Bye. -bye. Bye.